Welcome to another episode of Ask the Zamboni Experts. I'm your host, Doug Peters, and along with me today from the Zamboni Company is Marty Elliott. Today, we're going to be having a chat with Henry Boucher. He's a legend of hockey from Minnesota, a little town called War Road, Minnesota. Henry, welcome. Glad to have you today. Well, thank you, Doug. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, was very fortunate to get to watch you play hockey, and uh, I'm honored to have the ability to uh, chat with you today and talk about uh, growing up, your career, and uh, what you're doing these days. Um, I was wondering, since you grew up in War Road, how has War Road changed, and how has it stayed the same um, from when you were younger? Well, it's still, uh, you know, I mean, it's cold as heck up there. We went from uh, skating on the river to an indoor arena, but it didn't have artificial ice. We skated on natural ice through my whole high school career up there. And it wasn't until probably the late 70s when they had artificial ice put in and the old barn. And then in 1992, they raised enough money to build a new arena uh, along with uh, another smaller arena called the Olympic Arena. But, you know, that uh, hockey's changed quite a bit over the years. You don't see kids skating out on the river very much anymore. You don't. You don't see them carrying their bags and their sticks down the street in town. You, um, you know, you see parents driving them to the rink for practice, and and they get their hour on the ice, and then they're done. They're playing Nintendo or some other type of game, and they're inside and they're really focused on that sort of thing. Uh, very rarely do you see guys like T.J. Oshie and Brock Nelson come out of a small town like Warroad that, uh, you know, that produces such a uh, heavy amount of Olympians. There's eight of us that came out of that little town. There's, a, a, you know, I think there's 90 Division I players. Um, and then you have all of the pros that uh, came out of there. It's, uh, you know, it's an amazing little town, but you have to be committed. You have to, you know, enjoy the outdoors, enjoy the game. And, and, uh, you know, you don't see that, although a lot of people are moving up there because of our traditions and, and culture up there, our, our hockey culture. And, uh, uh, you know, there's more outdoor activities with snowmobiles, four wheelers, ice fishing, cross country skiing. Um, you know, we try to provide free ice time for everybody that's growing up and and, um, you know, we have volunteer coaches starting at a young age. And, you know, so it's there. We give them the opportunity, but very seldom you see somebody like T.J. Oshie or Brock that really stands out and is a rink rat. It's interesting that you mention uh, Brock Nelson. I've followed his career just a little bit. I believe he was the... Um, final first round draft pick by the Islanders the year that the draft was held out here in Los Angeles. And he is the grandson, if I am correct, of uh, Billy Christian, who played on the 1960 Olympic team, a gold medal winner. Uh, and his uncle, Dave, played on the 1980 Olympic team uh, for USA gold medal winners. Um, so quite the family pedigree. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, it it uh, just runs in the family. It, uh, you know, you get families like that. And, and uh, uh, you know, of course, Billy and Roger, Christian, their their brother, uh, Guinea, played in the 56 games. They won a silver medal in Cortina, Italy. And, you know, it just kind of carried on from there. And Cal was quite a negotiator. Cal Marvin, I'm talking about the godfather of hockey up there that uh, was able to uh, bring in the national teams, the, the Olympic teams on Olympic years. He brought in, you know, the Norwegians and, you know, this is a senior hockey team that, uh, and, you know, his, I guess his uh, pedigree, you know, he lived and died hockey and was well connected and was able to do that. So as a kid, you know, gave us a lot of incentive to be at the arena, scrape the old rink off, you know, between periods and, uh, you know, watch these players that were, you know, were uh, international 
heroes, you know, for us. And and it really gave us an incentive to to watch all of these uh, players come through, even you know from foreign countries, the Swedes, I think the Norwegians, the Finns came through there, the Czechs, you know. So it, we're able to uh, see all of that and really use that as a springboard for you know our career. Well, it's amazing in a town that's that small that there were two companies of such stature. One still exists, the Marvin uh, Brothers, uh, with their windows, and uh, Christian Brothers Sticks, which uh, I spent a little bit of time uh, swinging around on an ice rink when I was growing up uh, back in Minnesota a long time ago. Yeah, all of that growing up really, you know, I mean, you had... People like Stan Makeda, Bobby Hall come up there, you know, to get their sticks or get their patterns fixed. And so you were able to see all of these people. And and like I said, it really gives you an incentive to, you know, uh, gives you a platform to to really excel at, you know, at the game. And and uh, it, uh, it was a great place to grow up. I uh, raised my family up there as well. And uh, now I'm here in the Minneapolis area, but um, I still go up there. I have siblings up there. I've, I've got uh, a daughter and grandkids and stuff up there. So I, I try to get up there three or four times a week, year. Well, that's awesome. Henry, can you tell us a little bit about the experience you had in the state high school hockey tournament? I know for me, as a spectator, uh, I was lucky enough when I was a sophomore in high school to see Mike Ramsey play as a senior uh, and lost to that dreaded team that uh, of cake eaters that you guys did as well uh, back when when you played. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about your experience with the high school tournament, how your team got there, and uh, the battles that uh, you faced? Um, yeah, I played high school hockey for five years after the state Bantam champion in 1964 which we won um you know i went into high school and kind of got my feet wet the first year as a defenseman and you know started building but we never quite made it we thought we were going to win it maybe when i was a sophomore because we had the state Bantam championship you know a few years before that but you know as, as players get older you you change a little bit. We didn't have the mix. We didn't have the, you know, the attitude of, of really winning. We were kind of arguing amongst ourselves and, and it just never worked out until I was a senior. There was only two seniors uh, on the team. And then we had a really good Bantam team come up and uh, you know, it all, we all meshed together and uh, we were ranked pretty much uh, number one in the state at that time and expected to, playing the state tournament, which is the biggest tournament, you know, probably in the world for that, for that age group, because they draw 19,000 to 20,000 people a game, you know, for these, there's eight sections that come out, there's a double A, and then there's a single A, and the smaller schools are the single A, they don't draw quite as many, but the double A's, uh, I, I tell you, it was, it's a really amazing to see how many people uh, are at those games. And uh, people take their vacations, and they all come up from Florida. They'll come up from uh, Phoenix or whatever, you know, meet here at the state tournament for a week. And uh, so it was really a blessing for, for us to be, um, you know, ranked number one or number two all year. We ended up losing to our arch rivals in the section tournament, Rosal, and we but we had a chance to go through the back door. There was nobody representing section three, so section seven and section eight runner, runners up were able to play. And uh, Doug Palazzari was playing with Eveleth. He's the executive director at the Hockey Hall of Fame now, um, and. That game was just up and back, up and back, up and back. Just people hanging from the rafters. It was one of the best games I've ever played in my life. And it was just a flurry down there, a flurry at the other end. And we were tied, went into overtime. And, and then I ended up scoring with no time left on the clock. 
and they counted it. And it really pisses Doug Palazzari off to this day. <laughs> I'll have to I'll have to ask him about that because it's he's just, gonna be he's gonna be on a podcast with us next week. And I'll just so say, I'm gonna, so, every time I see him I just rip the shit out of him. <laughs> Oh, that 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 sounds like something that I would do, uh, Henry. I, I get the great opportunity to uh, go back and forth with our uh, folks at our Canadian plant about the 1980 Olympic team and and how they did. And Marty's shaking his head right now, but that that's great. And it, it's a it's a different tournament now, uh, the state high school hockey tournament. I've tried to explain to people, and I remember we used to uh, beg for tickets, and down in the cities it was hard to come by. So we would reach out to the rink operators, uh, managers up in uh, the Iron Range, Paul Forlan from Hoyt Lakes. I don't know if you know that name or not, but uh, I, Paul, I know the name, but I, can't, I don't can't remember. It, I'm gonna meet so many people. So oh yeah, and he used to get us tickets, and I can I mean they're up in the rafters, but we didn't care. It was uh, it was a great tournament. I disappointed that they've gone to the 16 teams. Uh, but I understand if it changes. But um, give us a little bit more about the when you got to the tournament and how you guys did and uh, where you guys ended up in the tournament that year. Well, actually, let me start with this. We have a we had a um, quarter round. We had a semifinal, and then we had the finals. So we had to travel by school bus from Warroad two and a half hours down to play a game on a, I think it was on a uh, Tuesday night. Then you get back at, at 11, 1130, 12 o'clock, and then they had to go to school the next day. And then you had a day off, and then you go play the quarterfinals the same way. And then on Saturday, you went down there again to play the finals, which we lost. And then we ended up having to, travel three and a half hours down to Hibbing on Monday to play that game. So we were tired, you know, we were tired and exhausted. Uh, it was exhilarating. We finally made it back home and then rode the school bus down here for seven, seven and a half hours, stayed at the St. Paul Hotel. They That year, they, uh, they were renovating the Civic Center, so we played at the Metropolitan Sports Center. And... Um, it was pretty amazing. It, uh, you know, it was warm. The ice was was different. Um, you know, the the people were really, really excited because there was more tickets available, and um, you know, it was packed house every every night, every day, and um, you know, they kind of isolated us, uh, you know, because of the press and this and that, but. You know, we were there to win the tournament, and which we did. We lost in overtime to Edina. That's where the cake eaters came from, by the way. Yes, um, it was it, it was something that, as a kid growing up in South Minneapolis, uh, you uh, you just didn't really care for them because they're usually the the rich, privileged kids. And uh, when you got older, it was the place you strived to live: uh, lower taxes and. Uh, better schools than the city of Minneapolis had, but uh, I, I understand your disdain for them, and hopefully it's mellowed over the years, like mine has. Well, it has, and you, you know, going to the state tournament like this each and every year, I had, uh, you know, I had my book on display down there. I sold it. Uh, you know, I had a booth there for about four years, going through that both boys and girls tournaments, and uh, did very well. Um, talk to a lot of people. In fact, I talked so much one day that I lost my voice. I mean, there's just so many people coming by the booth, shaking hands, buying books, buying pictures, and, you know, visiting about old times. And, you know, it's old home week. It's like a reunion each and every year that you go to that thing. And you seem like you run into people that you haven't seen for so long. And uh, it's, uh, it's really a treat. Now, Henry, one of the things that they didn't do back when you played in the high school hockey tournament, they didn't have the hair flow contest that they they had the last several years. How do you think you would have fared since uh, you're famous for having worn a headband for your years in the NHL? 
Well, I I have no idea. You know, it was, uh, you know, we were, that was the least of our worries, I think, when we came down here is, is you wanted to look nice. You know, we were, uh, you know, in suit and tie for the banquet, opening banquet, and, you know, got interviewed and stuff, and we skated, and, and then we were pretty isolated. We really didn't go anywhere or do much. We stayed at the St. Paul Hotel and busted over uh, to the Met when our game was about to come up. And uh, in fact, we played Minneapolis Southwest that first game and won that four to three. And then we, our nemesis from Rosal, we ended up playing them in the semifinals and beat them out. So that was a big feather to hat, but you know, it was, it's probably one of the highlights of my, my whole career is playing in the Minnesota State Tournament. You have no idea as a young how much, um, you know, you appreciate just being there and, and joining all the festivities and playing in front of 19, 20,000 people. That's really remarkable. Yeah, I was lucky enough. That was back when my dad worked at the Met when that took place. And uh, I always remember those times fondly, and we're hoping to have Reed Larson, another former Red Wing and uh, former Minnesotan, uh, on to do a podcast with him. He uh, graduated from Roosevelt High School, as did I, but Reed was a few years few years older. But um, let's talk a little bit about the 1970 Worlds, because you played on that team as well, and that was a gold medal team for the USA. Can you share your experiences with that team? Yeah, after high school, I ended up going and playing in Western Canada. I played with the Winnipeg Jets. And we had uh, Brandon, Estevan, Swift Current, Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatoon, and Flin Flon in that league. And um, it was, you know, we went on a bus trip. Seven, we played seven games in nine days. And we slept on the bus pretty much. And got box sandwiches and you know I always thought about that as paying your dues and that's the first time I really experienced the uh, you know the loneliness the uh, I guess uh, you know being an American up there and you know the cat calls from the crowd and other players and not only that being a Native American playing up there um, and the the slang and the racism and discrimination that 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 happened during that type time period and you just have to just bite the bullet and you know i i remember going on a bus um a couple of times and just going into the bathroom and breaking down but the teammates you know helped me um through those times or there were times i thought about quitting um but i couldn't i had that pride you know and so you work through that stuff and, you know, you just have to realize it's ignorance that, uh, um, you know, that, that developed and, and um, you know, they're just trying to get under your skin. Um, but I enjoyed my time up there playing the game, learning a lot, playing with better players. I was able to take a leave of absence from uh, Ben Haskins, uh, said you know murray williamson actually talked to him and then said sure you know take three weeks and then come back and we'll finish the season out but yeah that team was um, unique i was 18 years old and played with uh, herbie brooks was on that team and george connick and Humphrey christensen uh you know gary gambucci and you know it was first time i've ever been to europe so uh, we played a couple of games in Switzerland, flew into Bucharest, which is behind the Iron Curtain, which when I give my speeches, these kids don't understand what the Iron Curtain is. Even. But it was communist country. It was very poor. We had, I think we were there two and a half weeks. Um, you know, I think everybody lost some weight because we never got a, didn't seem to get enough food. Um, but it was a wonderful tournament. We, we needed to win that to put the United States back in the A bracket in the 71 World Championships and uh, the 72 Olympics. So it was, uh, you know, it was a great tournament. Murray rewarded us by stopping in Rome for three days on the way home. 
and um, the food was absolutely wonderful. And uh, got back to Winnipeg, played um, played a nine a nine game uh, series against uh, uh, Flint Flon that lost in the ninth game in overtime. And uh, that's the mile north of Winnipeg. We busted up there a couple of times, and then we flew up couple other times but it was I tell you it was pretty rowdy up there I you didn't know whether you're going to get out of the arena sometimes but it was it was a great experience I went back and worked at Marvin Windows in the summertime I got my draft notice from the United States Army during the Vietnam War at that time and uh, I just called Murray and said hey I got my draft notice what am I going to do he goes don't worry about there's three or four other uh, guys that that are in the same boat, I'll call you back. So he, he didn't call me back for a couple of weeks. I was getting worried. So he, so I ended up volunteer draft in August of 1970. Went down to Fort Knox, Kentucky, went through basic training. Then I was assigned to the Metropolitan Sports Center um, on a TDY basis with temporary duty with no expense to the government other than my base pay. And then we played a 50 game schedule, um, played in the world championships uh, in Bern and Geneva. We played in Prague prior to that, uh, that tournament and we ended up in a couple of brutal games up there. Um, we ended up with quite a few injuries and, but we did end up beating Czechoslovakia. They really stood up in Prague, but when they got down to Bern, they didn't want to go along the boards. They didn't want to go on the corners, and we beat them five to one. And then, um, then we lost to the Russians and lost to East or uh, West Germany and Swedes and the Finns. And it was, you know, we just didn't have the manpower. Everybody's taped up and banged up, and so we ended up. Um, I had a Germany, I think, that year, but. Uh, um, you know, that taught us a lot of, of, of lessons, I think, because of the way the, we stayed on this mountaintop with the Russians. And we're sitting in, in the hotel drinking tea and these hard rolls and butter and stuff. And the Russians are out there kicking a soccer ball around in the snow, you know, keeping active and stuff. And, um, and the way they stretch, the way they train, because they train 11 months a year then. They, uh, you know, lifted weights. They did isometrics. They ran. They played soccer. They played basketball. Um, you know, they would, uh, like I said, practice 11 months a year. Um, they take one month off, and this is a Red Army team, and they would go to the Black Sea for a vacation, and they're all back training again. And if you train six hours a day compared to a team that, practices two hours a day who in the hell do you think is going to win you know i mean it's it's just uh, you know it's amazing they were just so strong they moved the puck so well they dissected the ice they uh you know we would always move forward move forward no matter what if you couldn't get a pass off you shot it in the russians would regroup at center ice and go back into their zone and then they'd trap you back there, you know, by moving the puck up. And, you know, that's where all that, you know, the center ice trap come from and all that stuff. It was just uh, from Tarasov, the, the Russian coach. After we beat the Czechs, we're up, we had to take this tram up to the top of the hotel. And we're sitting in this room. And Murray's, Murray's talking and then Tarasov walks by. He's like 6'4". And he stops and he looks in there and he walks up to Murray and he picks Murray up by the head and kisses him on the lips. And shocked us all. We're, going, <laughs> we're laughing because he was so happy because we knocked the checks off and they didn't have any, you know, they had a guaranteed first place. Then. But Gary Gambucci said, Jesus Christ, I'm glad he didn't know how to pinch kiss. <laughs> Uh, that's too funny. Uh, yeah. I, I, I've had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Gambucci on a few different occasions at some trade shows. And, uh, oh, yeah, I was pretty quick with it. 
What a wonderful guy. Uh, last name ends in a vowel, so we have a rule that he's got to be Italian, uh, like him and Palazzari, <laughs> I think both. Yeah. But anyway, we ended up, uh, you know, developing our training program at the beginning of the next year. Um, you know, we we ran, we, you know, we were at the athletic club over there. I can't remember the name of it, but the Met. Um, but we had access to, you know, handball, racquetball, basketball. We um, used the weight rooms. Then we, you know, we were over there for a couple hours, and then we'd go on the ice for like three hours, and just, you know, work on our, work on our puck movement, work on our conditioning, and played another 40, 50 games. So it developed us in, but we had less injuries. We stretched more. We did all of those isometrics, and we were, we went into the Olympics pretty healthy, and. Um, it was uh, pretty, pretty amazing to come out of there with a silver medal. Well, yeah, yeah, let's talk talk a little bit about the '72 Olympics. That's something that the the USA talks about the '60 team, which is the original miracle, I guess. Uh, and I've been blessed enough to meet several of those players, uh, and, and and meet as well as some of the players from the '56 team who won a, a silver medal as well. Uh, right. There's a general gentleman who played on both those teams that uh, ran an ice rink out in Framingham, Mass., and then a, a family friend of mine, uh, Dick Merida, um, who played yeah. on both those teams. Uh, great right. guy. But you you guys, the, the 72 team, I've, I've got a couple of things. I'm going to turn it over to you. One, there is two guys from the metropolis of War Road. Uh, I mean, what are the odds that two guys that would make it to that team, you and Wally Olds, and then to to win a silver medal when it wasn't really expected. So maybe you can let us know how it uh, played out over there in Japan. Well, we um, <clears throat> we played every other day. Uh, actually, we we checked into the Olympic Village. We flew back to Tokyo, spent a couple of days there. We played uh, Poland there, and we played the Czechs there. And we ended up uh, one and one. And um, but we were in, you know, like I said, in, in remarkable shape. Um, and with all the stretching that we did prior to each each game and you know each event uh, and throughout the season really helped us stay away from the injuries. But we. Um, we had a play-in game against Switzerland. We beat them 5-3. And, um, and then we lost to the Russians 7-2. We lost to the Swedes 3-2. And the Swedes were, you know, they had Hedberg, all these guys on that team. And I played with Tommy Bergman. And I said, what happened to you guys in the Olympics? He goes, oh, my God, there's a couple of guys that fell in love with these Japanese women, and they wanted to they wanted to leave the team and stay with them. It disrupted the whole team. So after tying the Russians, the first game started going down. No. Through, you know, the next game was a little more sloppy. The third game, the Finns beat them. You know, you know, they just went downhill. They ended up out out of the medals, but we ended up beating the 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 Czechs. We beat uh, the Finns. We beat Poland. So we end up with a three-two record. That's what it's all about. It's it's about the about the the camaraderie and the friendship that the Olympics bring together. And um, you know, we had discotheques and you know, we had an area that we could, you know, socialize in. They had four major restaurants that we could eat in either one of them. They had American food, and then they had Far Eastern food and European food. And, um, you know, we trained hard on our days off, and, and uh, you know, we just didn't have any injuries. And, and it really, really made, uh, it really made a difference. 
Henry, do you still stay in touch with uh, any members of that 72 team? We, we do. I see Murray uh, once in a while. I, uh, uh, Bruce McIntosh, uh, we're, you know, we, we email each other and we usually, we go to Florida once a year, usually in April, but because of the COVID now we, uh, decided to wait a year before we go back down there again. So, but everybody's, you know, um, everybody's getting old, man. I'm 69. So um, you're just, you're still a spring chicken, my friend. It's, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's something that I, I believe age is a number and hopefully uh, we all have many years left to go. What, one of the things that you mentioned was uh, you talked about Herb Brooks and I, I'm just wondering what your relationship was with Herb. I know I've seen a few quotes about him and how talented he felt you were, but uh, maybe you can fill us in a little bit about Herb and how uh, things went between you and he. Well, other than being picked on all the time, I really liked him. He, uh, he, he had that ability <laughs> to know how to push people's buttons, I think. <laughs> Well, here's what they did. He calls up. I'm, I'm, we're staying in a room with Ozzie O'Neill from Marquette. He's 19, I'm 18. And uh, Donnie Ross from Roseau, George Connick played in that team, and Carl Wetzel was our goalie. And, you know, they just connive. You know, they're trying to, they're trying to play tricks on you all the time. So we had to bring our equipment up to the room so that Herbie gets on the phone or, or maybe it was Don Ross and start talking like the Swedish rep from Sweden. He wanted to compare some equipment. So we said, sure, you know what, you know, we'll go come down and get interviewed and stuff. So, well, bring an elbow pad and a shin pad, maybe a glove. And so we each grab some stuff and then we go down and sit in the lobby and pretty soon Herbie walks by and goes, Oh, what are you guys doing here? While we're waiting for the Swedish press guy to come and interview us and take some pictures. Oh, okay. So he takes off, and then pretty soon Donnie Ross comes by about five minutes later. Oh, what are you guys doing? You know, I mean, after five or six guys, you kind of dons on you, know, we've been had. You know, just <laughs> stuff like that. that uh, I mean, you hardly dare to go out of your room after, after a while. Uh, I'm, Henry, I want to toss this over to Marty. He's got a couple of questions that he'd like to ask you. He's had a pretty good career in hockey uh, as well, and uh, way better than I am uh, being able to answer those kind or ask those kind of questions. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Henry, thanks for uh, spending the time with us. I, I have to oh, say absolutely. that some of these stories you're telling, I'm, I don't know if you can see my, because uh, we have our video. I don't know, maybe you can't see us. We're just howling in the background. Some of the, some of the <laughs> stories you're sharing. I love it. Hey, listen, I want to talk about 1976-77 Colorado Rockies. Uh, uh, yeah. An individual that I followed uh, who was drafted second overall for the Kansas City Scouts, Wolf Paymont. You uh, had an opportunity to play with Wolf, I believe. I did, yeah. He's yeah. a great guy. Yeah. Tough, hey, why don't you share, share with the audience? Yeah, share with the audience uh, your experience uh, playing with uh, Wolf and and if you guys uh, what kind of relationship you guys had. Well, we were neighbors out in um, you know in Kansas City and and uh, out in Colorado, and he's just a good guy. He's just very loyal and uh, you know hard nose um, and loved the game. Yeah, and it's just uh, you know we we had a a bunch of kind of misfits there with, I mean, players from that nobody else wanted basically. And uh, it was a tough road. It's tough to play like that when you don't have the incentive. But Wilf, you know, came to play every day. And, uh, you know, you can tell by his, his stats, you know, playing against, uh, you know, all of the top lines because he was a starter. And, and uh, just to, a, a great guy. He had, uh, you know, great sense of humor and and um, liked to have his pint now and then. And and uh, I think he ended up in Toronto, I believe. But um, yes, after did. the, I was in uh, when I was in Colorado. I was on my way out. I only played nine games out there, and and the, the National Hockey League knew that I was going to end up suing them because of the, the Forbes incident. 
um, you know, because that wanted criminal trial, but it resulted in a hung jury. And I called um, Eagleson up. Um, he wouldn't even return my calls. Um, wanted some help, you know, as a player, what to do. Um, you know, what are what are our options? Um, so we ended up uh, having to sue the National Hockey League, the Boston Bruins, and Dave Forbes in a civil suit, which took us five years, but we ended up settling that. But uh, uh, they didn't really want me to play. I think when Johnny Wilson was a coach out there in, in Colorado, he uh, uh, just came to me and he said, they don't want me to play unless they absolutely have to. So. I only played nine games, practiced every day, and I wasn't about to do anything stupid about, uh, you know, because I had a three-year contract yet, so. But anyway, we ended up settling that, and I left there in 77 at 25. Yeah, an unfortunate uh, incident, and I'm sure, I'm not sure if Doug's gonna talk to you about that, but uh, I do I do remember, and uh, I'm not uh, in your age bracket, but I do remember the incident. Um, because I used to follow the Colorado Rockies, believe it or not, back here in Ontario. I don't know. It was just one of the teams. I, I think it was Wolf Paymont and uh, and some of the other guys. I mean that and that that lineup in 1976-77. There was only three Americans and the rest were Canadians. Did you kind of feel like a Canadian playing uh, with the Colorado Avalanche or Rockies back then? No, you don't even. You know, you don't even notice. You know, when you when you're playing National Hockey League, like, you don't really care where you're, you're from. You know, that's when the uh, the Europeans started coming over. Tommy Bergman was one of the first ones. And then Lindstrom from, I think, Finland. And uh, there was a guy I played with Los Angeles. Uh, you, uh, what the heck's his name? He had long blonde hair. Played out there. Great skater. Played in the National Hockey League quite a while. But... Right. Um, yeah, it was just, uh, yeah, there were mostly Canadians, you know, very few, um, you know, like Division One players, mostly juniors, you know, coming out of Western Canada and Eastern Canada and the Maritimes, so. Yeah, yeah. I could never understand those guys in the Maritimes. I don't know what they talk to fast. <laughs> did, did they ever make you kiss a cod? <laughs> no. <laughs> kind of something to do down east. <laughs> thank, thank God. <laughs> There you go. Back to you, Doug. <laughs> Great. Thank you. It kind of leads me into a, a question. A lot was made out, Henry, of the uh, East, Midwest, West rivalry on the Olympic teams. Um, did, did that exist on the 72 team? Because there was a fair split between Minnesota boys and uh, guys from out East. Uh, what was your experience on that 72 team? Well, it was... It was good. We had one guy by the name of Dick McGlynn, and he's, uh, I think he's a mayor of Medford. He's a lawyer now, but, uh, you know, he kind of was a practical joker, talked all the time, and kind of kept everybody loose. And, um, you know, so, it, you know, we had Sheehy, and then we had Huffer was our captain, and and we had Lefty, Lefty Curran. Um, you know, so some of the older guys that, uh, you know, were, were good leaders, kept everybody in check. You know, we, uh, you know, we had our times and stuff, but, uh, and a lot of laughs, but, you know, it was, uh, it was good. It, uh, we didn't have that rivalry like they did in the, you know, in the 80 team. Yeah, I think some of that 80 rivalry was pent up uh, dealings between the alleged, uh, what the animosities between uh, Boston University and Gopher, the Minnesota Gophers. I, I think there's still people out east. I've read Mike Ruzioni's book, and he claims that there was uh, intention by the poor little Gophers to go out there and, and take it to those Terriers. And uh, it, I think it's going to depend on who you listen to and how accurate they are now this many years later. Right, and that's what it boils down to is somebody's opinion. So... You know, I I just uh, let those things slide and form my own. There you but, go. You know, Herb uh, did a masterful job uh, containing those guys and and motivating them, and you know, it was great. You got so you, the opportunity. You, 
he used, got the everything, he used everything that Tarasov used in his training and stuff. Uh-huh. And it uh, it looks like, if I'm correct, the uh, you got the chance to play with Mark Howe. Um, I'm assuming that's Gordie Howe's son on the 72 team. Could you tell that he was going to develop into the player he did in the NHL? Yes. Yeah, he was – God, he was only 16, you know, when he played with the Olympic team. And he, uh, he you know, didn't play full-time. He played – Part of the time, but when he was out there, you know, he could he could really motor, and um, he had a great shot, great sense of the game, you know, where the puck was, where the guys were on the ice, and and um, yeah, you could tell he was going to be an all star. You got the opportunity uh, in the seventy five seventy six season to play WHA hockey and NHL hockey. Can you tell us a little bit about? the differences and what was going on with the WHA at that time. Uh, did you have any concerns about getting paid? Because that was a real uh, issue back then with that league, whether checks would make it to the bank and clear or not. Yes, that's what I, you know, I left uh, right around Christmas time. And I was, I think I was the first one to leave, but talent wise, we had, that was probably the best team I played on because we had, you know, we had Shaky Walton, we had Dave Keehan, Pye McKenzie, Mike Antonovich. Um, I mean, we had some, we had some good players. We had great defense, Rick Smith. We had good goaltending, John Garrett and Lefty. And um, we were we were losing six nothing down in in uh, Phoenix one night, and uh, and we came back and scored seven goals in the third period to beat them. It was just we just turned it turned it up, and you and you could. You know, um, it was it had some great goal scorers, and uh, you know just contain the the forwards. Our our defense was was pretty good, kept everybody wide. So, um, but I I you know there was always that concern. You know we drew around ten thousand, eleven thousand people. And then we had Brackenbury and Jack Carlson on that team, and shit, nobody's gonna mess with anybody, you know. It was, uh, you know, we had some pretty good fighters and stuff on there. It was a different era of hockey back then, and I know that the Saints had certainly had a following. And what wasn't Glenn Sonmore? Was he a coach for the Saints, or was he just one of the coaches in in the WHA? Harry Neal was the coach. Uh, Glenn was our general manager. And uh, I remember when they went into Hartford, um, he started all the fire, fighters on the on the same line. He did the same thing in Boston when the North Star, when he was coaching with the North Stars. You know, you could get guys who scored 40, 50 goals, but he'd rather have Jack Carlson out there. <laughs> Oh, I, I remember those days with the uh, the Carlson Band Club at the Met Center, with the oh. uh, the glasses and the the nose, and and Jack with wearing the the Stan Makita Cheese Dome helmet uh, <laughs> that he had. <laughs> a diff a different era. Uh, can can you tell us a bit about uh, your books and movies projects that you've got going on, uh, Henry? Okay, in 1992, I was raising my family up in Warroad, and uh, I had joined USA Hockey and National Hockey League in their diversity program, along with Willie O'Ree and uh, Lou Barrow and uh, Gary Bettman, and, you know, put all this whole thing together. And we were doing uh, uh, inner city stuff with Hispanics, the Indians, the... Uh, uh, the Blacks, uh, you know, hockey's for everybody, and did that from two, uh, 1992 through 2008. And uh, that same year, we were, as Indian Olympians, Native American Olympians, I was invited down to Albuquerque during the national, uh, oh, it was the... Uh, 
gathering of the nation's powwow. There were there were ten Native American Olympians, and there was only four of us living. And that was me. I was the youngest one in '72. Then there was Billy Mills, and in '64 uh, when he won the 10,000 meter in Tokyo. Then there was Buster Charles, who who uh, won a gold medal in basketball after the war in '48 in London. And then there was Jesse Rennick, who ran in the 32 games. He was 96 years old. So I was really excited. I never even thought about how this all came into life. You know, I mean, I never really thought about Native American Olympians before. But after that, after visiting with them and hanging out with them for a weekend, I thought somebody has to do a documentary series on these Native American Olympians. Now, that was a great idea then. I still do. I'm working on it now. Um, but it takes time. You know, here I am in Warroad, you know, raising my family. I'm, I'm coaching up there. I'm Indian Ed Director of Ward Public Schools. I'm selling real estate. Um, you know, it's uh, I, it was just too busy, and I didn't have any resources to speak of. You know, it's 350 miles down here, um, and I really didn't have the time to run around and meet with different people about this project, although I met with some. And they thought it was a great project, but they didn't have the passion I did for it. So uh, I just let it ride, but it was always in the back of my mind. And um, after my youngest son graduated from high school in 2006, uh, Willie O'Ree and I were doing a hockey school up in uh, up in uh, Wasilla, north of Anchorage. I called Willie up and I said, hey, let's talk Dick Heron, who is a lawyer up there, into doing a diversity program hockey school up there. I said, he's got lots of money. He'll fly us up there. We can go fishing for 10 days. You know, have a good time. And so we did that. We did hockey school during the day and we took a couple of days out where we took kids fishing and, you know, caught these 25 pound salmon. And it was a good time. And uh, I ended up uh, moving up there in 2007. So I was up there on and off for seven seven years but i needed a story so i that's when i wrote the book i i, I was just going to write a story for the film you know like the story and then do the script and and uh, i thought what the hell i'm just going to do a book but where do i start so i started with the with the spirituality of the ojibwe i talk about the migration of the ojibwe over a 500 year period from the east coast coming into the midwest and canada as well and uh, and then I just didn't want to make it a hockey book I wanted to tell the story of on my mother's side how the Ojibwe's migrated in, up on Lake of the Woods and uh, and then my dad's side they came from uh, uh, Nobinway Michigan which would be in the UP and that's when they were putting the railroad from east to west and made it into Kenora. So they, and they were building it west. So that's why you have Treaty 1, Treaty 2, Treaty 3 up there. So um, there were some guys that from Lake of the Woods are opening up Lake of the Woods for fishing. They're opening it up for timber. So they came down and talked to my, my great grandpa about coming up there. He had lost his wife the year before and he had a couple of sons. So they went up and and uh, ended up staying up there and they uh, were boat builders, carpet uh, carpenters and lighthouse keepers and they had uh, timber booms pulling it into Kanara and uh, you know fish camps all over the place up there so uh, and they really didn't know how to gillnet fish up they were they were gillnet fishing down on Lake Michigan there so that's how my other my other arm ended up there and and my mom's side uh, actually moved to Warroad and Buffalo Point which is just across the border in Manitoba so my mom and dad got married in 1932 and you know continued to commercial fish with uh, you know Buffalo on Buffalo Bay there and um, and but you know and then how we ended up moving into Warroad and my dad would pull a boat up on the 
on the beach in Warroad on the sand beach and with a tractor and and then he would trap in the fall and then cut pulp in the winter time and then fish all summer but i want to put all of that in there the the development of that whole area and but not only you know just a, a good hockey movie but i wanted to say hey i used all hand-me-down skates shit they were I had a stuff newspaper in the toes and wore about three four pairs of socks and they you know and then and they were still loose but you just uh, skated down on the river and or in the ditches and stuff like that. And that's how we played. And I don't know where road hockey came from, but Guinea and those guys, Billy and Roger, you know, they were playing road hockey, you know, back in the 30s and 40s. Henry, we've had discussion with Pat Kelleher, who's the executive director of USA Hockey. And we're looking forward to talking uh, with Doug Palazzari uh, at the U.S. Hockey Hall. Uh, can you tell us, uh, because it's so important for USA Hockey, uh, about the, and it's not just USA Hockey, I think it, it, it touches hockey everywhere, including uh, Canada. Can you tell us how you're continuing to help grow diversity and inclusion in the sport of hockey today? Well, I'm... <clears throat> I'm the vice president of the National Coalition Against Racism in Sports and Media. So we advocate for, you know, uh, you know, our students, our, our, our Indian community throughout the United States, basically. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, the Washington Redskins and, you know, at, at the colonization of the United States, they started putting bounties on Indians and they said well if you get kill an Indian we'll give you five bucks and they would haul their bodies in and these ox carts and there was too cumbersome so they said well just bring us the heads and then after a while they said just bring us the scalps and as they were scalping these men women and children to get their bounty all of the blood ran down a lot of the blood ran down their face and they called them redskins and that's where that term comes from. And that's why we uh, got rid of the game, name. And, you know, we, we have to stand up for our youth. You can't have somebody drunk at a game with a red face, with turkey feather headdress on, drunk, and it scares our kids, our grandkids. You know, they're going, geez, look at that guy, you know. And they don't want to, they don't want to be there. And, uh, so those are the types of, of situations that we try to address, the names, the logos. Uh, there's still a ton of them out there, you know, high school-wise, uh, college-wise. Uh, we're working with the Cleveland Indians now. We're working with, we work with the Vikings uh, in, in lieu of the uh, Washington Redskin name. We're working with the Atlanta Braves, um, Kansas City Chiefs. And uh, unless you justify like Warro did, you know, when we battled a Sioux for this pro for this area, so we're called the Warro Warriors. Here's the difference: we battled the Sioux, and we have our blood on that land. And we talk about we talk about uh, you know commitment. We talk about fighting for something that you believe in. The rice fields, the you know the the food on the water is why we migrated, um, and the stories that came out of out of those battles and the proud name, and one of our chiefs, in fact, it was T.J. Oshie's great 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 grandfather who actually sold some of the land to the school in 1915 up there and said we would like if you're going to have a school name we would like the name world warriors in honor of the blood shed here for this land so you take the washington redskins they don't have that background you see what i mean yes yes sir and it, it's you know it, it's a changing time and it's still i think you you know i chatted before we 
I uh, got on this podcast uh, a week or so ago, and, and it's something that I think that it's going to take time, uh, you know, a, a more time than some people would like it to, but the, the hopes are that things will continue to move in the right direction. And, well, it's a, you know, it's learn at the kitchen table. You know, racism, discrimination, prejudice is learn at the kitchen table when the kids listen to their parents talk about this one, talk about that one. You know, it's a learned process, so we can try to unlearn it. You know, you're not born that way. I, I completely so, agree, Henry. It, it's something that I taught. I talked to you about my daughters. Both my daughters are adopted, and uh, when they were born, they don't know color. They don't know hate. They don't know love. They don't know anything, and you have to teach them. And uh, my goal was to try to give them an open mind so that they could uh, be educated and, and make good decisions for themselves as they grew older. Absolutely. And most, most kids are, are pretty good. There's a few that, um, that need a lesson. Yep. Just like, just like some of us adults need some lessons every now and again. Yeah. Henry, can, can you share, um, as we get to the end of our, our session here, can you share a little bit about uh, Minnesota NHL alumni and uh, your activity with that organization? Well, you know, it's I think we have about 60 players here uh, living in the area, which is pretty good. A lot of a lot of us are getting older, you know, and 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 some of the new newer players that are playing with the Wild and stuff, and they really that retired or choose to live here are, are really not getting involved. And, you know, we never made the money that these guys are making and, you know, shit, we all have to work and slave away. And, um, but, you know, we, we really having a problem trying to get these guys more involved with it. And, and most of the players that, you know, my age don't, don't even skate anymore, but <clears throat> we do have a pretty good faction that, uh, um, maybe, you know, 10, 10, 12 players that actually rotate and skate and pick up a few other players. But, you know, there's golf tournaments, there's, um, um, you know, celebrity games, there's, uh, you know, we're trying to, um, uh, you know, stay involved with the, with the community. It's, it's been hard this year. There hasn't been much going on with, uh, the COVID and, uh, with the season and uh, so, um, but we try to fundraise for different communities throughout uh, for their good causes, whether it's hockey, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, health or, or education or something like that, that we donate back to. So, and everybody tries to, you know, it's a good feeling to be out there and try to, you know, participate and, and be present. You know, even though you don't do much, if you're present at one of those things, it, it helps out a lot, even. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I'm going to have one last question, or it might be two questions. I, I reached out to Dennis Hextall, uh, another former North Star, former Red Wing. I, yeah. And we, ha we have a huge Red Wing fan, Ben, uh, who produces these podcasts. Uh, is a huge Red Wing fan. Can you touch a, a little bit? Did, did you get a chance to play with uh, Dennis? And what was your time like with the uh, Red Wings? Well, I I uh, I was drafted in '71, but remember I was in the Army, so I couldn't sign. I had to wait a year, and it was good because I was able to play in the Olympics then. But because I was in the Army. Um, when I went to Detroit, it was the last 16 games of the 71-72 season, and Gordy had retired earlier that year, and he was, you know, they really didn't give him anything to do. He was kind of the PR department, and so he kind of took me under his wing, and I worked in his hockey school with Mark and Marty and Bugsy Watson and up in St. Clair Shores, there. we had a good time, and, and, um, and that's that summer later on that uh, uh, Gordy ended up signing with Houston with Mark and Marty. Um, it was a big loss for Detroit. They should have just bent over backwards for him. But anyway, um, it was, uh, you know, it was different playing, uh, you know, coming from the Olympics 
and it's it's like playing in well that's a tournament so you're up you're up for these games and uh, when you when you have to play and consistent night after night after night and travel and you know it's different you have to adjust to that and um it was uh it was a little bit different i i played on a line with red berenson and billy collins we were the checking line for detroit so we started every game against the lamar line and makita line and look esposito line and rattel and the french connection and all chasing those guys around all the time so you know the stats didn't look that great but and we got the job done I thought we should have made the playoffs and they only had you know they only had two divisions they had yeah the eastern division was New York Boston Buffalo Toronto um Detroit and you had to be in the top four so only eight teams made it there were only 14 teams when I played so um it was uh it was disheartening. We could end up in second place in the other division, so it uh, didn't make any sense to me at the time. But um, I enjoyed my. It, it was one of the greatest sports fans I've ever played in Detroit. And uh, when I got traded over here, Hexy Hextall was here, so um, so I got to play with him over here for that well half a year, I guess, after my eye injury. I, Played a couple of games after that. I can't even believe they they asked me to come out and play. I couldn't even see out of that eye in uh, extreme double vision, you know. Um, but the players of you know the teams that I played against, I thought were pretty gentlemanly because I you know when I'm kicking around trying to find the puck in my feet, I could have been leveled a couple of times and they just kind of stopped it. Yeah, you know, that 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 was. was we didn't touch on that topic much, and I, I didn't know whether that was something you wanted to expand on or not. I was in the building that day um, when that happened, and uh, it was tragic to me from a standpoint of a Minnesota um, hero uh, being attacked. And just I wasn't a big fan of the Bruins because they're the big bad Bruins at the time, and that really just further f further increase that uh tension and just to what what you went through I, I can't even fathom henry it was it was a sad day yeah it you know it took a long time to get over with and didn't have any help from the from the players association or the league you know um clarence campbell came down and sat down and did interviews and wrote everything out in longhand it took us a week you know for him to interview everybody but the thing about it was then is that gary flackney from the hennepin county attorney's office you know said um, mr campbell only suspended him for 10 games and if you you know it was on tv back in boston it was on tv here in the midwest and sold out crowd and if if you hit somebody like that with a stick on the street, you'd probably get one to three years plus a $5,000 fine. And um, so that's why he um, charged Forbes with uh, aggravated assault. And, um, and it was, you know, kids watching that, it's going to be okay. It's okay if I, I do that in my youth game because i don't have to take the responsibility and that's where the helmets came from and the masks and um, all that stuff but that was his point resulted in a hung jury there were 12 jurors 10 for conviction one abstained and one said no so they didn't want to retry it yeah i i think my dad actually got uh, brought in as a witness to describe the dimensions and and such of the rink um but that that's still still um lives in my memory uh, certainly not to the level that uh it does in yours 
Well, Henry, I want to thank you very much for your time today, for, for coming um, and, and spending time on our podcast. We want to thank everyone for listening in to another episode of Ask the Zamboni Experts podcast. Have a question for one of our experts or an idea for a future episode, please email your questions or request to info at Zamboni.com. For more info and additional podcast episodes, please visit Zamboni.com forward slash podcast or search Ask the Zamboni Experts on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. This is Doug Peters along with Marty Elliott wishing you an ice day.